Uh, the poems I want to read tonight are from two different series of poems that I'm working on, uh, each of which has a slightly weird story about it. So uh, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with this one. Um, so uh, for those of you who uh, are my age or older, you will probably remember the days when you had to go into a library and when you wanted to find something rather than going to a computer terminal, you had to actually go to this large stack of drawers and pull one of them out and start looking through these little cards, the, the old-fashioned, uh, you know, manual card catalog, right? So a few years ago when I was in grad school, I was at one of these computer terminals and there was this stack of note cards next to the computer terminal, so I picked one up to write something down on it. And I flipped it over and I realized it was actually a card from the card catalog because the library was discarding these now useless cards from the catalog. And I thought, wow, you know, that's kind of a shame. But then I started to thinking, you know, what kind of information is being lost when we're discarding all of these cards? Is there really, you know, can, do they have a kind of story? Is there something to them? So I wrote a series of card catalog poems. Now, uh, basically, these had a specific procedure. The basic rule was this. In each poem, I had to use every piece of language that was on the card. So every word, every number, every abbreviation, everything had to go in there. Um, I could not add anything or leave anything out, but I could repeat and rearrange things as many times as uh, I wanted to. Now, uh, why I set myself this crazy task, I'm not exactly sure. But um, uh, the result was a number of poems that kind of chart a sort of journey through this weird uh, ancient technology of the card catalog. So uh, I'm going to read a few of those uh, to start off. AC899.A52PC.1 The Door of Modern History In's graven page includes the doctrine of Peters, indexes 899 pages of jihad. STK CSL inserted. In Amsterdam, Islam and colonialism moot on. Door C.1 in Dutch, jihad. Rudolf in Amsterdam includes indexes, the doctrine two pages inserted. Thesis, Amsterdam. Summary includes Jihad, 1979, in Dutch, Bibliographies, Graven Hage. 23 centimeters of modern history, The Stellingen of Doctrine, 242 pages, pages 201-225, Jihad, Islam and Colonialism, 09-02-80AM. PR 2638.S695-1985. Sweeney, Public Soul of Princeton, Bibliographical. Theater, the Spirit, Stack References to Coin. The Psychology of 1950 includes 850,118 references to Spirit, University of the 22 Centimeter Soul. To spend the Johnson, press the Gordon. Next, stack New Jersey and index ISBN 0691 one Spend 2250 to Spirit Sweeney to Princeton, circa 1985, 85-B4529. Bibliographical Psychology of Sweeney, page 243, includes references to 11885, the card soul of New Jersey. A C of theater, 84-42557, a GMS slash GMS coin to spend on Gordon D star C1. Next, index Sweeney by soul, public spirit, XI, theater of coin, CST3, university of references, C000652. Sweeney, spend the continued coin, public theater of soul. And just one more of these. PR 4854.W39-1899. His Majesty Willie drums black sheep fore and aft. 
child of King Lutz II or Ralph the Third. Eight six zero seven zero three. We drums. Bah. The New York Kipling. The city Rudyard. New other I. Pro. Winky. Show. Fenno. Stanford. Felt. The provenance of stories. Copy signature eighty six B six one zero eight two of Kipling. Eighteen ninety nine. Call the drums. Felt on four and aft. Raw, raw, ba. Blue cloth, 16 centimeters. D4, B000268. One child, 1865. One majesty of 1936. CST binding, Willie, 156 pages by provenance and signature. RF and company drums, 860,702 stories. Willie contents the drums. Okay, so the, uh, the second series of poems is uh, an, an ongoing series uh, which is called 100 Chinese Silences. Now, uh, how many of you are familiar with the work of Billy Collins? Poet, former poet laureate, fairly well known. Okay, wow, that's, that's very impressive that so few of you know who Billy Collins is. <laughs> so, um, uh, a, a few, uh, last year Billy Collins came and did a reading uh, in Madison and um, there were 1,300 people at the reading. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've seen that audience for, a uh, large audience for anything except maybe a football game in Madison. So um, Billy Collins is a very well-known poet. So Billy Collins read this poem called Grave, which I'm going to read for you um, uh, in a moment. And Collins spoke in the poem of the 100 different kinds of silence that the Chinese believed in. And I was like, <laughs> I, that, that doesn't sound familiar, right? I don't, what is he talking about? And then at the end of the poem he said, oh, uh, I, I just made that up. <laughs> so I was like, wow, okay. And, and then I, I was a little annoyed, but then I thought, um, somebody really needs to write these 100 different kinds of Chinese silence. So I set myself the task of doing that. I have now written 40. So, um, I'm, I'm not going to read 40 for you, but I, I will read a few tonight. But um, uh, what I want to, and the, what the series does is mostly parody poems by other poets, starting with Billy Collins, but then moving into other poets, who use the theme of China or Asia in some way as a kind of theme in their poem and sort of pokes fun at that tendency. So, um, I'm going to read the poem Grave by Billy Collins first to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, and then, um, and then I'll uh, read some of my own Chinese silences. So this is Grave by Billy Collins. What do you think of my new glasses? I asked as I stood under a shade tree before the joined grave of my parents. And what followed was a long silence that descended on the rows of the dead and on the fields and on the woods beyond. One of the 100 kinds of silence, according to the Chinese belief. Each one distinct from the others, but the difference is being so faint that only a few special monks were able to tell one from another. They make you look very scholarly, I heard my mother say, once I lay down on the ground and pressed an ear into the soft grass. Then I rolled over and pressed my other ear to the ground. The ear my father likes to speak into, but he would say nothing. And I could not find a silence among the 100 Chinese silences that would fit the one that he created. Even though I was the one who had just made up the business of the 100 Chinese silences. The silence of the night boat, and the silence of the lotus, and the cousin to the silence of the temple bell, only deeper and softer, like petals, at its farthest edges. So that's Billy Collins. Chinese silence number one. What do you think of this poem? I asked the tomb of my unknown grandfather with its livid, quiet marble. <laughs> a Chinese silence fell. It dropped from a glowering tree to perch on my shoulder. We looked at each other. It would have been hard for a stranger to tell one of us from the other. We both looked like monks or scholars, or like piles of drowned bones laid softly on the loamy earth. 
My grandfather said nothing. His Chinese silence coiled its tail into the shape of a long, lobed ear, one of the 100 American signs for anxious virility. Then the silence fell into a cardboard box full of other silences. Like blind puppies, they squirmed and snuffled for their mother. OK, I made that last part up. But you must admit it was a fabulous metaphor. No? Oh, now I see you are just as Chinese as all the other silences. <laughs> the silence of the heavily armed gunboat, or the silence of the drunken mariner, or my father's silence, like the Liberty Bell, only cracked right through. Uh, this is Chinese silence number three, and this is after a poem in which Billy Collins talks about how long the titles of Chinese poems are. Chinese silence number three. It seems this poet has nothing up to his empty sleeve but a deck of Chinese flashcards, each providing the first line that makes an eye wet or dry, shutter open, knee deep in nature, or floating in a vat of wine. Maybe he is choking on something he meant to swallow. Maybe atomic fallout is blanketing New York. Viewing penises adjacent to lotus flowers on a Sunday afternoon is one of his best known works. Dipping my finger in tepid tea is another one, but it's no pagodas keep me awake all night. And he takes the mother-loving apple pie with, I rode the subway on a sweaty night carrying a porcelain vase. It was very sad and seemed to be saying, fill me with cruelty or with one of your poems. When he pushed against the bamboo turnstile, it didn't play Wichita Vortex Sutra, Me So Horny, or whatever. It just laid there like a doormat. So I walked out on my loving wife to the sound of temple cash registers is a wire brush kissing my lips. And ten days of dysentery have kept us apart is a houseboy knocking his head on the floor of a room where a poet with thinning hair is sitting on a yoga mat with a bottle of scotch, muttering something about China and nuclear wind, about currency and hormone deficiencies. He doesn't notice as I enter here, pull up a bar stool, contort my spine like his in silence. This is Chinese silence number 13 after Billy Collins' poem, A Portrait of the Reader with a Bowl of Cereal. Every morning I sit across from him at the curio table, halogen lamps lighting all the bric-a-brac, curve of a knockoff Ming vase, a bowl of leeches, me in a scholar's gown or a kimono, he inscrutable. Most days we are suspended in a deep Chinese silence. He stares straight through me, imagining his sailboat on the Yellow River with its steel-tipped masts drawing erotic graffiti in the inkbrush sky. I offer him egg rolls, chicken fried rice, and cups of oolong tea, but he hides behind his copy of Ezra Pound's Café. But some days I may notice a little door swinging open in his balding skull, revealing his dreams of brocade-clad maidens sliding down the china slope of his mind. Then I will lean forward, delicate fingers trembling, to trace a shriek of aye on his folded gray matter as my words drip from his docile lips. Chinese silence number 14. You have the right to remain silent. That is your job. A ball gag plugs your mouth, and the immigrant girl with her loud sewing machine has been deported. So tell us about the mind of China. We want to hear the silent blooming of its cherry blossoms, the quiet unfastening of its gowns, its songs of soy sauce and tiny bound feet. Its trains have been blown up by dynamite. 
Its factories bombed into silence. Its mewling puppies have been smothered and its gods are suffocating inside specimen jars. Shanghai has been evacuated and each inhabitant issued an edition of Gary Snyder. So tell us about your ancestors, your grandfather in his bamboo cage, your grandmother drowned in the well. Let's hear about the unmoving trees, clouds, the stunted trees. Read the poem we have placed in front of you. The Pacific has been drained, and even Ezra Pound has burst from his grave, his moldering hand poised to translate what you do not say. Chinese silence number 22. The Italians are making their pasta. The French are making things French. And the Chinese cultivate their silence. They cultivate silence in every Chinatown on the persimmon of earth, mute below the towers of Toronto, silently sweeping the streets of Singapore clear of noisy self-expression. The Americans are in their sport utility vehicles. The Canadians are behaving reasonably. <laughs> but the Chinese remain silent, maybe with a cup of tea or an opium pipe, and maybe a finger puzzle or water torture is involved. Or maybe the Chinese are playing the Chinese game of ping pong, the pock pock of the ball against their tight-lipped mouths as their chefs dice scallions and bean curd. The Chinese are silent because it is their job for which I pay them what they got for building the railroads. Which silence it is hardly seems to matter, though many have a favorite out of the 100 different kinds. The silence of the well-adjusted mature minority, the girlish silence of reluctant acquiescence, the silence that by no means should be mistaken for bitterness. By now it should go without saying that what Crocodile Dundee is to the Australian and Mel Gibson is to the Scot, so is silence to the Chinese. Just think. Before I invented the 100 Chinese silences, the Chinese would have had to stay indoors and gabble about civil war and revolution, or go outside and build a really loud wall. And when I say a wall, I do not mean a wall of thousands of miles that is visible from the moon. I mean a noisy wall of language that dwarfs my medieval battlements and paves the Pacific to lap California's shores with its brick-hard words. Uh, so just two more of these, and uh, then I'll, I'll be uh, finishing up. Um, so uh, those of you, I'm sure, uh, many of you I'm sure know who Rupert Murdoch is, the, uh, the owner of News Corp and uh, Fox News, and uh, he was very recently at the center of a scandal in, uh, in the UK where some sort of his tabloids were being investigated by Parliament. And some of you may know that Rupert Murdoch is uh, married to a Chinese woman named Wendy Deng. And um, a protester during one of these hearings tried to get up and hit Murdoch in the face with a pot. Well, his wife, Wendy Deng, lunged forward as the guy was trying to hit Murdoch in the face with a pot and punched the guy in the face. <laughs> so um, this, uh, this image was played over and over again and led to uh, big headlines about Wendy Deng as the, his tiger wife. So, uh, you know, playing into these kinds of stereotypes. So I, um, I wrote a poem uh, for Wendy Day that um, each, all of whose words are drawn from different articles and blog entries that I dug up on this incident. Tiger, tiger, tiger wife. Wonder Woman volleyball spike. If you have an Asian wife, maybe she's not just a gold digger? Tiger wife or trophy wife, slam down sister or socialite, bright pink jacket and pencil skirt, not like gold digger who wants old man hurt. <laughs> Wendy Dang is a power ranger with crazy Asian magic powers. <laughs> Was in Red Army, trained to kill, agile PYT, hit like a girl, Crouching tiger, flying Murdoch, tiger wife clawed her way up. Up. Chinese blogger, catch dang fever. Wendy Dang, her homegirls call her. <laughs> Thank you for everything, Mr. Miyagi. 
business school graduate, yoga devotee, from communist obscurity, hello, you write a pirate DVD? Tiger, tiger, tiger wife, Wonder Woman volleyball spike. If you have an Asian wife, what if she's not just a gold digger? Uh, yes, I, I, can, I can show you the links for each one of those articles. I've not <laughs> picked any of that up. Um, okay, uh, the last poem I'd like to read uh, is Chinese Isles number 32, and this is after a poem by Alan Shapiro called Flower Pot. I lie back in the sagging mattress that holds the bell of my body like a bell unrung for 50 years and wonder if it's still okay to call someone a Chinaman. I guess these days they don't all wear coolie hats and hide their blushing faces behind bamboo fans. But when I turn on my television, they still all look the same. The same as when Fu Manchu ran his long fingernails across a white man's chest. Someone is saying something about the balance of payments in our national debt. I remember it when it was just the Russian bomb that scared us, and not the silent Chinaman. I can say that, right? Dark, empty eyes slanting down into the void. I fear that he will swallow me whole. My snuffling nose, my trembling arms, my bones in the rickshaw of his gut. And everything in the world I know falls like a hail of missiles into the Chinaman's stomach that will never fill. Thank you.